All right. I am excited to be here tonight. I'm excited to be back in Houston. What a blessing. What a blessing to be here with my brothers, my son, my pastors. I'm tremendously blessed. I just wish that my crew in Indonesia was here to get to meet all of you guys. I want to share tonight a little bit of what we have got to experience the last couple of years, but I also have uh, a revelation that God's been working in our hearts. We don't have it all worked out, but it's impacting us. It's changing uh, the way we see the work that we do, and I just want to share it. And I'm going to weave in to the message uh, some of the things we just don't put on the newsletter. Yeah. Amen. 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 Something that God's really been birthing in our heart uh, is agape. It's, it's a Greek word, and it means love. And we've learned that there's a lot of words in Indonesian that it takes many words to translate into English. Just last night, Teresa was telling me that it's been, there was a volcano eruption while I was here, and everything was covered with ash and powder. And she said, oh, mandung. It's been mandung, which means that it's been threatening to rain. So hopefully we get some rain to wash out the, uh, the ash. But she used the word mandung because I know what mandung means. It means that the sky is very dark and it could potentially rain. That's about nine words to one. And so there's many things in languages that when they... When when the hearer who is from that culture hears it and understands it, it paints a picture in their mind. And so I want to share with you some of the things the Lord's been showing us as the word agape. But tonight I'm going to share some things, and I'm going to share it from the, my heart, which is evangelism. To, to just, you know, when you look at the scriptures, I tend to look at it more of an ev an evangelist and, and desire to take it to the, the world. I always, before I shared this message in many churches, I always shared with them in, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, 18, he says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey all I have commanded. Man, the teacher says, we got to get together and we got to put some teachings together. And the pastor says, yeah, but it's about discipleship. And the evangelist says, you missed the main part. He said, go. When we hear the word of God, sometimes we filter it through the heart that Christ has given us. And it can, it can be interpreted in many ways. And so tonight, I want to read and explore this word agape from the heart of evangelism. One of the things the Lord was showing us about agape was... And foremost, that it's not prejudice. You see, there's several words in uh, Greek that mean love, but they're prejudiced or they're limited. They are limited in the scope of who it includes. Uh, I love my children. In that word, it's sorge, and sometimes it's translated the same word as familia. And that's where we get our word family from. See, I love my children, and just to be honest, I love my children more than I love David's children or JJ's children. There is an association that I have with my own children that is confined into my own family. And for a member to participate in it, you have to go through adoption for me to have the same love of familia for someone else. Um, better example is I love my wife. And see, I love my wife more than I love Nolan's wife. It's supposed to be that way. Amen? We have a problem when you begin to love another man's wife too much. But it's prejudice. It's supposed to be confined to one woman, the woman that I am in covenant with. And I love her. And it's beautiful. And the Spirit of God 
is always working on my heart to make sure that this familia that I have towards my children and this love that I have towards my wife in a loving way, not the eros, not, the, not that one, but the one that I'm supposed to love and cherish and adore her. He's always working on it because he can perfect it by the Spirit of God. And this, another love is philia, which is brotherly love. And we, we love our brothers. We need our brothers. And it's supposed to be that way. It is good. And philia, the connection you have there is not how you were born, but it's how we are associated. Um, I got a chance to speak in Japan, and I'm in some Brazilian churches in Japan, and they're speaking Portuguese. And I'm like, whoa, this is kind of crazy. You know, I'm eating Brazilian steak. I thought I was going to be eating some noodles or some sushi. And I asked him, I said, when Brazil wins the World Cup, what do you guys do? He says, we throw a party. I said, wow, you live in Japan, completely separated, but when Brazil wins, you throw a party. He's like, yeah, we won. I was like, see, that is philia. It's how you associate with your brothers. It's those in your city. Uh, when Hurricane, what was it, Harvey came through? Uh, Houston came together in philia, everyone helping their brother out. It's supposed to be that way. And I'm going to share tonight that agape is different from the first two. Agape goes beyond that any association whatsoever. And if you look at a map, you'll always notice that countries are very strong because they're familiar, but their enemy is always next door. And so there's a limit to how much this philia will go out because your enemy is right next door. Israel's enemy is all around next door. And so with this agape, it's not prejudice. It doesn't even originate from me because we would see it we would see this great agape we wouldn't have enemies we would be able to fulfill the commandment to love your neighbor without being born again I see beautiful families uh, and they're not in church I see countries that are strong in nationalism and they're not saved but to achieve this agape that I'm going to talk about tonight the source comes from God and for me to describe it and how we can easily miss it, I, ha I have to describe it. And the first way that I can describe it is that when the world looks at it, it looks reckless. Agape appears to be reckless. When, you, when I sacrifice for my own children, that's expected. When I sacrifice for my brother, that's, accept that, you know, that's what we would assume one would do but when we do it for the lost it becomes reckless I'm going to read you the definition of reckless it's to take an action without thinking or caring about the consequences of that action and the reason why agape is reckless is because the world looks and says don't you know the consequence of taking your family to a Muslim country? Don't you know the consequence? Agape says, do you know the consequences if I don't for those who don't know? See, when one way you can determine that something is agape is the world looks at it and says, mm, man, I don't know if I'd do that. that that's, that's reckless. And so one of the key things about agape, it always appears to be reckless. Jesus came for one reason, and it was to love mankind and give his life. Even his disciples were like, oh, we don't, we don't understand this. It looked like defeat, but it was victory because he came to live a reckless life of himself. He knew the consequences coming. What would have been the consequences if he didn't come? You see, we can look at what's going to be the consequences if I answer my call. Well, what's the consequences, not for you, but for them, if you don't? And so agape appears to Christians also as, man, that's reckless. So you know you're on the right path when 
preachers and other ministers start to call you reckless because agape is at work. I'm about to get into some scriptures. I just want to lay out. Actually, let's turn to Acts chapter 20. And let's look at verse 24. Let's look at a reckless life. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What's the task? The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul considered his life nothing to himself. But that it was that he would testify of the gospel. Gave his life for the gospel. I mean, if Paul was here today, every ministry would be saying, man, they're crazy. That's reckless. A church uh, that is centered around agape looks reckless. A church that's centered around family, they, they have family, church, community, they teach how to have the best family. The ones that are teaching and preaching about philia, love for your brother, then you come to their church and they teach how to uh, have the best relationship with your brother. But a church that preaches agape says, you need to get to the point where you don't consider your life worth anything to you. It's worth something to them. And that's where Paul was at. Paul was ready to recklessly uh, sacrifice himself for the gospel of Jesus Christ so he could testify of the gospel of God's grace. Second attribute of this agape is it has to have a pure motive. The motive uh, can't be found in familia. It can't be found in philia. It has to come from somewhere else. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter. It's the only motive for our actions that is acceptable to God. I'm going to say it one more time. It's the only motive for our actions that is acceptable to God. And we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not, and for the sake of the teaching, I'm going to translate it to the Greek. I'm going to say agape. Because we've heard it so many times. I want to use the word agape. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not agape, I am only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. Next one. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a... If I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not agape, I am nothing. Next verse. It just keeps getting deeper. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not agape, I gain nothing. Reading that, I'm like, man, if that wasn't agape, then what is agape? How can you do all that and not have agape? How can you give your life to be... How can you give your body to the flames and not have agape? If you do it, you gain nothing. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to talk about the church of Ephesus tonight. But before I go into that, I'll share with you how we got this message. We get to Indonesia. Um, The first uh, ministry that we have contact with spent 25 years in Indonesia. 
the man had returned to the States for five, ten years, whatever it was. He thought he was retired. He was, thought he was done. And God spoke to him and said, you got to go back. you got to go back to Indonesia because you didn't accomplish what I called you to do. I mean, he spent 25 years and he's planted nearly 35 to 40 churches in Indonesia. It sounds amazing. I'm like, whoa, dude, you, you planted 35 churches and God said you didn't do what he asked you to do? He said, they were already Christian. I went and there was, the Christians were scattered. They didn't have an association. He said, so I planted church associations. We grouped them. We taught them how to worship. We, we set uh, boards and taught the pastors how to get together and oversight. He said, we only planted Christian churches. We didn't have that many Muslims come to the faith. He said, I did it because it was easy. I thought I was doing God's will. I thought if we would plant these churches and we would encourage them, it would overflow into the Muslim community. He said, and I came back and it didn't happen. They didn't go to the Muslim. And so now this minister's back in Indonesia. And I thought it strange that he didn't go back to these 35 churches. He said, I have to leave that aside and do what God called me to do. And he said, don't do what I did. He just saved me 25 years of going in the wrong direction. And so we began to drive all throughout Indonesia. Ah, we're up in an area about six hours away. They're making the furniture for us. It's a little Christian community. And so I sit down with the elders of the community and I say, share with me how you, you all became Christians. When did this start? And they said, oh, it was with the Dutch over 200 years ago. I was like, wow, 200 years. He said the Dutch set up these big plantations. And what they did was the Javanese, who at the time were nominal Muslims, to work in these plantations and to live a, a better life it, it, in some way. I mean, they were rice farmers, at least now, that they were working and they would be fed because they were hired hands. To work for them, they had to become Christian. And they did by the thousands to work. And the, the Dutch said, it's okay because by the second and third generation, they will have been raised up in Christian homes and we will develop Christianity that way. It was, it was actually some Mennonite Dutch that had done it. But they left in 1945, right at the beginning of World War II. World War II came in, the Japanese came in, and the Dutch left. And so, what is that, 70 years ago? We just had an anniversary of Israel, 70 years. So it's about 70 years since then, maybe a little more, 75, including the years for the war. And so I'm like, wow, they spent 200 years here. Let me see what's, what's going on. I went to all the churches. Oh, my heart was breaking. There was no candlestick in any church. There was no move of the Spirit. There was nothing. And I'm beginning to cry out to God, Oh, God, I don't want to do something that ends in nothing. This is not what you were worthy of. You were worthy of it all. And if you ever read any books about going to the Muslim, there's a thing called a movement. And what a movement is, is about a thousand uncoerced, unpurchased baptisms. And it's not a magic number, but it's about. And what they say is, if you can reach a thousand conversions among Muslims, then if they take you out and this man out, they can't stop it. The movement is moving. So when Paul would go and he, they were baptizing thousands of first day of Pentecost, 3,000. There was a movement that was happening. No matter how much persecution came, they couldn't snuff it out because it had begun to move. And what happened is the Dutch went up and put up a province and said, come inside, become Christian, and it never had any movement. 
And so when we talk to missionaries, we, we talk about, you know, hey, you heard of this movement? Did you hear this movement? What it means is once the missionary is gone, the work continues. And what we're finding is in every place, when the missionary is gone, the church begins to recede and recede and recede. And I'm crying out to the Lord saying, Lord, that, not for my name's sake, not for our ministry's sake. I don't want to labor in vain. Paul said, have I labored in vain? We don't want to labor in vain. We want to see Christ glorified. We want to see every knee bow. We want to hear every tongue confess. We want to know if you take me out, the work keeps going. It's called a movement. So we're going to look at Revelations chapter 2. But I'm going to ask you to do something with me tonight. When we read, it's going to be hard. But when we read it, we need to be in the illusion of the first time. You don't know anything about this church, Ephesus. In fact, why don't we think that Ephesus is reading the letter for the first time? Don't you know they read the letters were distributed and all of the church of Ephesus came and said, Hey, read to us the letter. And we're going to go line by line. And we don't know how it ends. We're going to go line by line. And we're going to put ourselves in the church of Ephesus. Okay, let's pull it up. Ah, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars and in his right uh, seven stars in his right hand and he walks among the seven golden lampstands. I'm thinking, oh man, this is gonna be good. Because he's like he his introductory is dealing with what he's about to say. And he's saying, I walk in the midst of these lampstands. Okay, next one. I know your deeds. He took note of their deeds. He said, your hard work, whoa, right off the bat. What did he notice? Their hard work. They worked hard. As a ministry, we want to work hard. We want to be known as a ministry. They work hard. And your perseverance, man, this is going good. Not just the hard work, but the perseverance to continue in the hard work. When most people and churches we quit, we as Ephesus, we persevere. I know that you can't tolerate wicked men. Whoa, they're holy. They don't like wickedness. And I'm, you know, I'm reading this with our disciples. I knew there was something in there. This, this is not a message that I, uh, I am preaching uh, to LCM, this is what we preached in all the churches. I just want to share it with you so we can all join in. And maybe you guys can get an idea of what God's put on our heart that is causing us to get really desperate to make sure what we're doing is in agape. Amen? Amen. He says, you can't tolerate wicked men. And that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. This was a church that the false apostles couldn't pull the cover over. They knew their word. When the false apostles came, they were able to point them out. When men were wicked, they said, we will not tolerate this sin among us. Man, I'm, I'm enjoying Ephesus right now. This is like, Ephesus was, you got to understand... They were hardworking. They persevered. They couldn't tolerate wickedness. They tested the doctrines of these false apostles. Going to the Older Testament says, you are false. We know our word. Go to the next. It gets better. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name. And have not grown weary. This church is not even re weary at the moment. I actually got this when I was going through a hardship. 
I wasn't going through it alone. Actually, Teresa was going through a greater hardship than I. You all know the story. Uh, Teresa receives an eye infection. And, uh, you know, we thought maybe she had pink eye. I mean, you really don't realize. We've had some sicknesses. Abby had, had a, a, a real threatening sickness. Uh, but we, we endured. We endured hardships. But this eye thing, we were like, ah, it happened the day before Thanksgiving. Teresa uh, gets through Thanksgiving Day, one eye, still serving. And then right after we ate, she says, I think I'm going to lay down. I was like, it's got to be... It's got to be pretty bad for Teresa to go lay down. So she laid down and we spent time with the disciples that evening. She didn't have any sight. She lost her sight that quick. It was gone. She said, I can't see. I can't see in this eye. I said, we might have a major problem here. So we took her to the hospital. The nurse takes her and puts her in there. And I'm watching the nurse. I'm standing behind Teresa. And she looks at her eye and she goes, I knew that was not a good reaction. And she looked at us and she said, we can't help you here. I said, is it bad? She says, yeah, you're going to have to go to a specialist. There's only one man that can do what you need. And uh, I forgot his name, but we went to his place. And they tell us, oh, you just missed him. He won't be back till Monday. This is like Friday evening. I'm like, seriously? We got to go Saturday and Sunday? Thanksgiving was just on the Thursday. And so Monday, we're there first thing Monday morning. And he looks at it. And he says, it's bad. He said, your infection has gone through your cornea and is depositing uh, pus on your iris. It's not just a surface infection. Whatever it is actually went through her cornea all the way through and was inside her eyeball. And he said, we have to do injections now. We have to stop this infection. And so I don't remember who it was, but people were sending us. Uh, we're trying to determine what this is. And he says, we're going to get a lab done. And we're like, oh, we're going to get a lab done. We'll find out what type of this infection. Because he told us, he said, you're looking at four different infections. It's either antiviral, it's bacterial, it's fungus, or it's an amoeba. He's, and he gave us the, diff the good and the bad for all of them. And when he got to the amoeba, he said, you want to hope it's not the amoeba. Because if you don't catch it soon enough, the prognosis is it will kill her. It will go through her eye, eat through her optic nerve, into her brain, and it will kill her. So we're like, oh my goodness, we're dealing with something serious. This is serious. This is not some fever that we can throw ibuprofen at and just is going to go away. So we sent out some messages. We contacted our pastors. And we start receiving word from outside. We contacted some missionaries in Malaysia. Put your family on a plane. We have a house for you, your whole family, for four months. Everything, we'll take care of everything for you. Just get on the plane. I don't know what to do. So I said, huh, let's see if we can find out what this is. Let's get some, wait for the lab results. The lab results come in the next day. And they said, sorry, Mr. Vincent, we tested for bacterial and uh, fungus. That's the only two we can test for. And they both came back negative. And that was the two we were hoping for. Because at least we could identify and know it wasn't life-threatening. But then the doctor says, I don't trust the lab. Because really, we're unable to test and get a good result. He said, but if you go to the biology center at Gajah Mada University, uh, University, that's a big university, he says, go get some testing there. They may be able to test us. So we go to the microbiology lab, and the lady comes out. She literally comes out with a candlestick and uh, some swabs, and she's uh, clear, moving the glass above the uh, candlestick. She's wiping with alcohol. It was basically like we had gone seeing the school nurse. It was very primitive. 
They didn't have a, a burner or anything. It was just a candle. I was like, wow. And so they did their testing, and they said, oh, it's going to take four or five days. And we had um, uh, a team from the Horizon Church come in, the Morrisons. And oh, how we were saying, oh, it'll be nice when they come. Uh, at least they'll be able to pray for us. At least they'll be able to do those things. I had to prevent Eric from getting on a plane. Eric was like, brother, I'm coming. I was like, we got to get through this. And uh, Eric was like, we're buying the tickets, brother. I had to ask him, let us go through this. But I was about that time saying, I wish Eric and Jim were coming. Because you don't know the pressure. We didn't think it was that serious at first. It's like, oh, no, brother, it's okay. And about four days into it, we were like, I wish they were here. But just a couple of days, the Morrisons were going to be coming in. And they came in. And while they were in, uh, we left them with the kids, and we went to get the results. And the results came back negative. We have now passed the 14 days they told us that at, through about this point, if it's an amoeba, it's too late. They said, watch out for headaches. The headaches are going to get extreme. Watch her speech if she begins to slur any. If she says something and you're not quite sure what she's saying, be very alarmed. And so the night that we get our results in, Teresa gets a headache so bad she's got to go lay down. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what we're dealing with. And so I said, I just got to hear from God. I got to, the Morrison says, if y'all got to go, then go. You know, we'll shut all this down. If you need to go, go. Pastors contacted the pastors. They said, we love you. If you stay, we support you. If you go, we support you. I said, I got to hear from you, Jesus. I just got to hear. And so I balled up on the bed. And this tremendous pressure came over me. I was straining. It was just this. I was like every pressure I had been holding up for all those weeks was just pressing on me. And I was saying, I got to hear from you. I thought I was busting blood vessels in my eyes. I call it my Garden of Gethsemane moment because I went look in the mirror. I made sure I wasn't bleeding from the forehead. It was so much pressure. I said, I don't want to make the wrong mistake. I don't want to make the wrong decision, God. I got to hear from you. And God, I heard him. He whispered it to me. He said, don't run. Just don't run. He said, because if you run, it's over. The enemy will know how to defeat you. If you run, it's over. He will keep you out of the country over and over and over again. I said, but is she going to live? You just told me not to run. And the Lord said, just put your hope in the resurrection. Amen. Just put your hope in the resurrection. That will keep you from running. And I called Teresa in the room. I said, I heard from the Lord. The good news is, he spoke and he said, we're not going. The bad news is, I don't know if you're going to live. We got to put our hope in the resurrection. Man, all these missionary books started coming back to my mind. They were on the boats, and their children died, and they buried their wives. They persevered. They endured, just like the church at Ephesus. They ran, and they didn't grow weary. Man, that's a song. And I realized there were missionaries who went on the mission field, and when it came to death, they ran. They just didn't write books about them. Okay? We only know about the ones who put their hope in the resurrection. So I'm falling in love with Ephesus right now. I'm reading this from the illusion of the first time, and they, ran, they run. They don't grow weary. 
They don't back up. They go forward. Let's have the next verse. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. It was going good. And it was, I mean, I was talking with God and said, God, you know, we're going to persevere. No matter what it takes, we won't run. We will persevere. If we have to give our bodies, we're going to persevere. And then I come to this scripture. I come to this. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. I'm going to translate that from the Greek. He says, I'm against you. Because you abandoned the agape that you had at first. Next scripture. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. And, and all this is going on in my head. I'm seeing churches with no lampstands. I'm seeing they're existing. They're being persecuted. They're persevering. They're suffering for the name of Jesus. But they don't have a lampstand. There's no light in the darkness. And I'm looking at our own lives, my own heart, our ministry. You know, we persevere. I, I would hope that when you would talk about Brent, maybe tenacity might be one of the words you think of. I'm sure some probably some other words. But at least tenacity. Ephesus, I know your tenacity. Go back one more. No, oh, it's a four. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And as of viewing this from an evangelistic heart, it's going to depart a little bit than what you may have thought. We always say that God is our first love, and He is. And that we need to repent and go back to Him. But that's actually not what Jesus says. Go to the next slide. Repent. You've forsaken your first agape. Remember from the height which you've fallen. This is what we think it says. Repent. And come back to me. He says, no. Just do what you did at first. You see, you're persevering and you're doing all these things. But there was something you were doing at first. That if you don't repent and get back to it, he didn't say stop persevering. He didn't say you were persevering for the wrong reason. He just says you're missing something. And it's so grievous that if you don't get it back, I'm going to have to take your candlestick. I shared this board with a few brothers and I said, you know what? He's telling us of some precious ingredients in their church. They persevered. They pushed hard. They didn't back up. I said, if I made you a batch of cookies and I went and bought the most expensive cocoa that I could put in it, if I bought triple sifted wheat from France and imported it, and I used the finest baking soda, I mean, every ingredient is the finest that I can find because I want to impress you. And yet, I forget to put sugar in it When you take a bite, you might be able to taste that fine cocoa. You might even say, man, the texture. But they're nasty. <laughs> you see how no matter how much they spit on the cocoa, they're missing sugar. And the, the experience is not the same. I'm like, really, God? They, they got one of the hardest rebukes. This was the strongest church. I'm like, what were they doing at first? You're going to find it in Acts chapter 19 when Paul gets there. Paul goes into the synagogue. Up until that time, he's only been in the synagogue. He goes from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. His call was to the Gentile. And so he goes to, uh, in Acts chapter 19, he goes in the synagogue as it was his tradition to do. 
And he's preaching and he's sharing and he wins over a large amount of uh, believing brothers and also believing Gentiles. But when you preach to a Gentile who is in a synagogue, he already believes in Yahweh. So when you present the gospel to him, you can present that Jesus is Yahweh's salvation. You start at a different place. The difficulty of going straight to the Gentile is they don't believe in Yahweh. They believe in Artemis, Diana, something in that area. And so he's got to start the gospel where he's not as, I'm not going to say he's not as good. It's just not as easy. Because look, Paul, he knew he probably could put a six string from the law, prophets, and writing together like more than better than any of us. But that wasn't going to work with a Gentile who didn't have a clue what he was talking about. But at Ephesus, something happens. The synagogue kicks him out and rejects him. And he says, since you find yourselves unworthy to hear this gospel, I'm going to take it to the Gentiles. First thing I said was, when did... Peter say, we were going to go to the Jew and you the Gentile. Years before. He went and he, they extended the right hand of fellowship and they said, we will go to the Jew. You go to the Gentile. This is where Paul is finally answering that call. He sets up a school in Tyrannus, the school of Tyrannus. And he begins to preach to the Greeks, their mindsets, the philosophers. Man, if you, you want to talk about difficulty reaching somebody, somebody who has studied philosophy all their life without knowing the Word of God, they're going to consider what you're saying just another philosophy. But it was so powerful. It said that all of Asia was reached from Ephesus. Whatever Paul was doing, men were running with it. I wondered, what did the church have that it spread so fast? What did they have that the modern church just doesn't quite seem to have? How could Paul go into these regions for just a few short months and it just start spreading a movement that he laid down the gospel, he could leave, and the movement was still forward? All I see is when the missionary is gone, the, the movement is back in. And churches get smaller and smaller and smaller and more persecuted and more persecuted. And so they're about to start painting the windows black now. They're taking the signs out of the front of their churches. Why? Because the Muslims are blowing them up. Trust me, they're suffering. They're enduring. And yet they don't have a candlestick. I said, oh, God, what do we, what is this agape? How, how, what is it? I know what it's not. What is it? How do we get it? What do we do with it? Where does it come from? Go to Romans chapter 5. You know, I'm going to just quote it. Matthew chapter 24, 12, and it says, in the last days. The agape of men? Of many. Uh, actually, it says most. How much is most? It's most, right? The agape of most is going to wax cold. Sounds like a candlestick going out, doesn't it? No longer shining light. Where did I tell you guys to go? Romans 5. Let's start in verse 5. Because this was mind-blowing for, for me. He says, and you can read verse 4 before, it, but really I want to catch the last end of 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God, we're going to read it slow, because God has poured out His agape into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Whose agape is it? What does he do with it? Where? 
God pours out his agape into our hearts by the Spirit. And so can you see when he walks in and he removes the lampstand, which is the Spirit, they no longer have his agape. They may still have perseverance. They may still have, not God's agape, they may have their own agape. I don't know. I want to look at agape that is from God in our hearts. Not what we reciprocate. See, we, well, God shows us agape and we reciprocate back to Him. Go to verse 8. Now, let's go to verse 7. 6. I want to say it's 18. Now I'm guessing. I know I had it written down here. No, it's eight. I'm sorry. I'm a, I didn't. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to show you a key to that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10. And then we're going to come back to Romans. Actually, I was looking for 1 John 4.10. That's why I didn't find it in Romans. Okay. This is agape. Not that we agape God. We do agape God. But this is not the agape he's talking about. We're reciprocating back to God only because he first loved us. This is agape, not that we agape God, but that He agape us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, we're just responding with agape because He first showed us agape. And I love it. John says, this is agape. Not that we agape Him, but that He agape us. And we're going to read a scripture where he first agape us. And so there is a reciprocation of agape that you can persevere in, you can uh, suffer persecution in, you can even suffer for the name of Christ in. But there's this agape that has his heart set on the lost. And God's supposed to pour that into our heart. And I want to show you something. Oh, John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave. God so agape Israel. No, the world. It includes all of it. It wasn't just Israel. He does agape Israel. He made a covenant of agape with Israel. But now, He so loves, He so agapes the whole world. What does He do? Something reckless. He sends Jesus. So to preach the gospel so that those that hear will no longer be condemned. How did God look at man? He saw him condemned. See, this agape, God is looking at the world. He doesn't have agape. He is agape. And he is looking at the world and he says, they're condemned. If I don't do something, they're condemned already. I said, wow, God sees men condemned. And there's a desperation that rose up in God and says, I'm going to make the greatest sacrifice for them. I'm going to go lay down my life for them. You know how many people reject Jesus, reject the gospel? It didn't matter. Because what, 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 what is it if you only love those who love you? What is that credit to your account? And so he's willing to love someone first. Man, that's agape. I'll share this with you. Brenton won't mind. We're driving out of, I don't know, we're, drive, we're driving all over Houston. And he's an aggressive driver now. And some guy's trying to get in front of him and he's like, well, what, what you doing? What's this guy think he's doing? 
I said, Brenton, let's replay this scenario. What, what, what's this guy doing? I'm not letting him in. Oh, he's going to force it. What are you doing? Oh, Nolan, what's up, Nolan? <laughs> it's Nolan. I asked him permission to share, to, to use him as an example, so he's not upset with me. I said, Nolan, can I use just your name, not your driving skills? <laughs> but you see how something was diffused when Philia showed up? He was the enemy on the street just a few minutes ago. That's my brother. I'm going to slow down. Come on in, Nolan. <laughs> what about when you're in the checkout line at HEB and this woman in front of you has got 400 coupons? Yeah. And you're like, dang, man, don't they know? What are all these empty cash registers for? They got two people working here. And you're looking at the person in front of you, you're like, man, I'm just want to. She's condemned. And she's going to hell. And it, she's just in our way. We're eating at Waffle House. I've eaten at Waffle House multiple times since I've been here. <laughs> I like Waffle House. And she's not here tonight, but I was pleading with Ruby. Ruby, you got to get right with Jesus. You got to get right with Jesus. She says, well, I'm... I'm I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I should be. I said, you're kind of in that lukewarm position? Yeah. So see, you don't even know the scripture. I can't even use that on you. I was like, Ruby, you need to get right with Jesus. I care about you, Ruby. And I wasn't doing that to show off because you know what? Everyone I come into contact with, do I ha can I see them the way God sees them? Is God's agape in my heart burning for them? And, and it's easy to, to do that at Waffle House. It's a bit harder to do it in Indonesia to Muslims who just might be children up. I said, God, I don't have this love. The Lord says, I want to pour it into your heart. I'm going to pour my agape into your heart and you're going to love them. And if they do, you're going to say, God, don't forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, seriously, I, that will not come from me. I'm saying, this is what Ephesus was missing. They were persevering. They were still going on, but they fell from something. He said, go do what you were doing at first. The first thing I can see is that Paul is there. And these people are excited. Man, they are burning their idols. They're burning their books. It's going crazy. It's spreading like wildfire. The church is on fire. It's spreading all through Asia. And now they get this letter. And, God, and Jesus threatened to take their candlestick from them. And I realized, you know what? I can persevere. I already said in my heart, I'm not leaving Indonesia. I'm persevering. But guess what? Staying is not the goal. I didn't go there to stay there. I went there so condemned men can hear the gospel and believe and be saved. But I got to go in agape. Because if I don't, I will not have, I will not be salty. I will not be shining bright. I referenced it. Let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 32. It says, If you agape those who agape you, what credit is that to you? What? Let me read this again. If you agape those who agape you, what's your reward? None? What credit do we have? 
if I agape someone who agapes me, we're just reciprocating, right? He says, look, even the sinner knows how to do that. The sinner knows how to love their children. The sinner knows how to love someone who just helped them out. But where does this, how do you get this agape from someone who hates you? How do you fulfill when Jesus said, look, I know you heard, love your brother or love your neighbor. He says, but I'm telling you, you got to love the enemy. I mean, when, when Jesus was sharing this, a lawyer who knows the law says, okay, I know the commandment. And the commandment is for me to love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? I mean, who did Jesus say? How about we make it modern day? There's this Palestinian, right? Who's go, there's a Jew going down the road of Jericho, and he falls amongst these in the Palestinian. I mean, you, that's unfathomable. The Palestinian is no, long, no more loving. It's not the Palestinians love the Jews, and the Jews just, when you're enemies, you're enemies. Neither one loves neither one. So how do you love your enemy? <clears throat> Even John says, look, I'm not writing to you a new commandment. It's a commandment you have from the beginning, but it's a new commandment. How can it be a new commandment, but it's not a new commandment? I want to show that to you. Romans 5, 8. Now we go back to Romans 5. Because you see, he's, Israel was commanded to love. Wow. Go love. I got a commandment. I'm supposed to love. And they saw God's love towards them in the covenant. But they didn't necessarily see God's love towards the heathen yet. I mean, they're the apple of God's eye. They, they don't have quite yet this example of what this love is supposed to look like. So what does God do? He gives us an example. He demonstrates agape. Not the agape that we show to him, but the agape that he first showed to us. It says, but God demonstrates his own agape for us in this. When does God show us agape? While we're still dead in our sin. While we were his enemy. He came to die for us. You see, I can reciprocate back to God. But I will kill my enemy. I won't even let him in front of me when we're driving. I'll go to another line if he's in front of me and I'm in a hurry. I, I got to hurry. I got to go to church. You got to love your enemy. It's not in you. I'm telling you, it's not in you. It's not in me. To love the people who are blowing up Christians in Indonesia. It's just not. But God does. He so loves them. He sent me there and he says, you know what? If I didn't, if I didn't spare my son, I'm not going to spare you either. Because agape, God's agape in my heart is me willing to do exactly what he demonstrated. That while they're yet still sinners, I'm ready to die. For them to know Jesus. Right now we're in, I'll just be honest with you, I'm not there yet. I say it. And I'm believing it's going to happen that I'm going to love them that way. And I am... But I'm praying, God, you got to put this thing there. Because I see a whole lot of ministries that didn't have it. They didn't have it because they don't have the lampstand anymore. It's gone. Let's look at verse 7. Very. Rarely. I think rarely, rarely is a very descriptive word. But very rarely is even rarer than rare. Very rarely will anyone 
die for a righteous man. I mean, it's ra if rare is rare, then this is rare, rare, man. You, Though for a good man, listen to what he says, someone might possibly. You know, it could have said someone possibly there. They might possibly. That means they might set out on it and say, yeah, I don't think so. They might possibly do it. Next verse. But God demonstrates his own agape for us. When did he die? Oh, man. I got to love the sinner. Not love my calling and my ministry. I got to love the sinner. I got to love the Muslim. I got to be willing to sacrifice my life, my wife, and my children. And if that would happen, you know what would happen? Movement in the kingdom. Amen. Because forceful men are laying hold of the kingdom. They are growing the kingdom. It's moving. When we read the book of Acts and we read the book of Martyrs, no wonder they couldn't stop this thing. We just talked about it last Wednesday night. They were so moved. That the soldier didn't have to say anything. He didn't have to do anything. He's safe. He's alive. He'd rather die with these men. We got to have that. I got to have it. So, Paul wrote to the Ephesians church. And I said, I wonder, I wonder if Paul was picking up on this. You know, John was a few years later when he wrote the book of Revelation. And there was a letter in there to the churches. Did Paul ever address the church at Ephesus about this subject? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 17. Paul actually begins to pray for him in the letter. And this is Paul's heart. I mean, he planted this. This is his lifelong work. He's doing, he did what we're doing now. And he has great affection for him. And he's about to pray for him. Let's go to 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. Next verse. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in agape. He's saying, I'm praying you set down some roots in this stuff because if you don't, you're going to be moved. I'm praying that you be rooted and established in agape. That you can't be moved from this agape. Next verse. And that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the agape of Christ. Christ is agape. Not our love for Christ. Christ is agape. He said, I just pray you can fathom this. And you don't miss out on how, how, uh, how wide or how long or how deep. He wanted them to know the fullness of this love, this agape. And he wanted them to be rooted in it. Because he knew if they wouldn't set down roots in that one thing, they'd lose their candlestick. They'd lose their witness. 
They wouldn't shine for the nations. They would hang their hat on their suffering. They would hang their hat on their persecution. They would hang their hat on, I'm still in Indonesia. It's not about fight. It's about love. Oh, trust me, you'll be tested for all of you who want to go outside of the U.S. I mean, we're tested here. How much more when you go outside? See, that's what I love about my church because I can preach this to you and you have it. We have it. But it gets tested that much more when we go on the mission field. You say, you know, I have it. I just say, I don't have enough. I just don't have enough. Because I love them. But will I do like the other Christians and paint my windows black? Take my sign out and hide and say, it's getting kind of rough right now. The love of God or the love of Christ compels us. It compels us. And if you're going to go to a foreign soil, you're going to need endurance. You're going to need to know what it is to suffer. You're going to have to put your hope in the resurrection. Trust me. But if what you do is going to stand the, t- the test, the fire that God sends down on man's work and he finds out if he built it with uh, brick, hair, stubble, or if he built it with gold, silver, and whatever the other one was, bronze, yeah. Your work will be tested. Your work might be burned up, but you'll be saved as one through the fire. But Paul says, had I labored in vain? If you give an eye, a child, or a wife, what's the worst thing that can happen? That you labored in vain. It's no credit on our account. It's not enough. We've got to have this agape. I'm almost done. Because we serve the God who will leave the 99 for the one. He's always looking to save the lost. That one is around us all the time. See, I live in a country that it's the one that's saved and the 99 that's lost. And God can't get the one to do anything. It's called us to be the salt and the light. And once the salt loses its saltiness, the scripture says... How then can you make it salty again? I don't know. I don't know if you can. What did he say it was you? He says, throw it out on the road. Men will trample you. That's what it's worth. I'm like, is it, is it this serious? I mean, if we're the salt and the light, and Jesus says you no longer are salty, then that's a serious that's a serious uh, situation there because you're not worth anything. Men will trample on you. The wicked will trample on you. We have to continue to be the salt and the light. And without a candlestick, we have no light. I want to finish with this. Which one of us is going to love the lost? We love our families. We love our brothers. But which one of us are going to love the loss? That wherever we go, whether it's the gas station, where Walmart, Indomaret, for my Indonesian friends, are we going to see condemned people and have such a burden that it doesn't matter what we look like? I mean, do you realize that most of the times I don't say anything is because pride it just, it just doesn't seem like a good time God what if I, I'm going to look stupid and this person is condemned already I started well they're not that bad maybe I'll come back 
let's go to 1 Thessalonians 1 3 and I'm going to finish up. This is the recipe for success. Just in case you heard something I didn't say, I'm going to re say it again. Because sometimes I go back and I'm like, whoa, man, I said that all wrong. It's going to take perseverance. Be ready to suffer. Don't grow weary. You got to have it. And cry out that God would pour agape into your heart. This is the recipe. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Your labor prompted by agape. And your endurance inspired by hope and the resurrection. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm done. Come on, would you guys stand with us today?